Good evening, this is Woodblock Printmaker Dave Bolt, speaking to you again from our shop here in Asakusa, although from a different room that we usually do. This is our print party room. This video is another in the David's Choice series, where I take items from the shop or from my own print collection and try and explain why I find them interesting. In the previous episode, we spent quite some time looking at a single print. This time around, we'll also look at a single item, but it's quite a bit more substantial. It's an entire book. The Favorite Flowers of Japan. It was first published here in Tokyo in 1901. The edition we're going to look at today came along five years later, in 1906. It was published by Takejiro Hasegawa, who is most well known to us these days as the man responsible for those wonderful crepe paper books on Japanese folk tales issued in the Meiji era. We'll be looking at one of those in a very future episode soon. This seems to have been produced either as a commission or perhaps a joint venture between the Hasegawa organization and a nursery that was operating in Yokohama at that time. Now by nursery, I don't mean anything to do with kids, I mean a garden shop, a business dealing in seeds, seedlings, and bulbs, and plants of many kinds. The business had been established by a German man in Yokohama in the late 1800s, but was by this time owned by somebody called Albert Unger. There's an advertisement, if I can get my page turning worked out, here we are. There's an advertisement for his business at the back of the book, and it gives an outline of the services he offered, which seem to have been mostly export-oriented, sending Japanese plants overseas. The book isn't an exact catalog of their products, but it provides a wonderful overview of the entire flora of this country, arranged for the most part in a seasonal presentation. When we look at the table of contents, we can see this, starting with the trees that blossom at the new year and progressing from there through the course of the year. Each plant is shown like this, with a woodblock illustration combined with a genteel text written by Albert Unger's wife, Mary. Now that's the general description of the volume, and it sounds mildly interesting, particularly, I suppose, to those interested in horticulture. I myself have no such interest, but this book is one of my most prized possessions. To try and show you why, let me pick a couple of illustrations, almost at random, and take some close-up looks. <laughs> I said random, but you know I've chosen this in advance. This is the page for the azaleas, one that I keep coming back to again and again. Number one, white space. You know, it's the hallmark of so many of these Japanese illustrations. But the white space on this one isn't actually unprinted. If we arrange the light properly, we can see there's a light rain falling. Not that our bumblebee friend here cares about it. And when we zoom in closely, we can see these are woodblock prints. And the carving is all based on very finely drawn brush strokes. The illustrations for the book, excuse me, they were prepared by Mishima Shoso, whose main work was as a designer of the Couchier and other magazine illustrations. And you can believe that he was very well trained in the fundamentals of drawing with a brush. Just look at this. There's just like a, a squiggle here and a squiggle here, a faint splash of color. And that's all you need to bring this plant to life. But look how carefully they've done it. The gradation on this green to give it depth at the base, the faint brown at the tips. There's a barely visible tone inside these petals. It's so faint, I can't even identify what color it is. And as with many of the illustrations on this volume, we're not at full bloom. The images leave us with the sense and feeling that there's more to come. Let's look at another one of my favorites. Plum Blossoms. This one, too, shows that same Hasegawa hallmark. It's delicacy to the point where you're not actually sure if anything is printed there or not. The faintness on this moon, is there anything actually printed there? Isn't this faintness from fading? No, this is the way they conceived and produced it. Now at this point, some of you out there might recognize this one, because we've been sending out our own reproduction of this image for many years now. But somewhere along the line, when we were preparing our packaging, our print got assigned to a horizontal orientation. As you can now see, the original is vertical. And this does make a difference. Fresh shoots on a plum tree, of course, head straight upwards. Ours head sideways. It's kind of interesting, though, that not once over all the years I've been sending this out has anybody ever called me out on the air. Dave, this horizontal orientation is not natural. Somehow we seem to accept art as just art without too strictly questioning the reality. Or maybe 
people are too kind to call me the idiot that I was. Let's find another page. Peonies. There's occasional, you know, splashes of richer color here and there in the book. But it seems I just couldn't hold that mood more than a second or two before returning to the disappearing act. At this point, we can investigate a very interesting aspect to this book. Let's go and look at the coliform. After the date here, Meiji 34, we have three names listed. Hasegawa Takijiro was the publisher, as I mentioned earlier. And next to him is Kaneko Tokujiro. This is the man who manned the workshop where the woodblock prints were made and with his own carvers and printers or perhaps subcontracting out to different people. But there's a third name here also, Amano Koichi, and he is listed as the English lettering printer. What's going on? Well, the book is printed with two technologies. The illustrations are all woodblock prints, carved on cherry wood and then printed on a fine quality hosho paper, but all of the text of the book is printed not from hand carved blocks, but from modern metal type. And of course, no sooner do I hear that than the question comes up, what did they do first? Now, getting this under a magnifying glass gives some hints. If we zoom in on this page, the table of contents, where there's no illustration, we can see the bite that the letterpress process left in the paper, where the metal type pressed into the sheet. But if we go to this page, where there's illustrations and text, the bite is no longer present. The paper has been flattened from the backside by the pressure of the printer's baron. Aha! Printing press first, followed by woodblock production. Except there are also plenty of pages where this is not the case. Here's one with an image where there is no bite of the letterpress. So I think I'll keep this question at the present as being undecided until I can find conclusive evidence one way or the other. There's a ton of other interesting things about this book. Let's go back to the outside. The outside cover, it at first glance seems to be fabric boards as in most traditional books, but it's not. It's woodblock printed on hosho paper in the same manner as all the inside pages. But they took the time and trouble to emboss these covers with a fabric-like pattern. Now, this wasn't carved. It seems to come from some kind of netting or screen over which the paper was pressed. The resulting prints were then glued down to boards for binding. There is a very, very interesting map of Japan here in the preface. This is hilarious. It shows a country not so familiar to us these days. Japan is tinted in a yellow-orange tone all the way down to, and including, Formosa, the place we know now as Taiwan, which Japan had taken from China a few years before this book was published. Korea, however, though, is shown in white, as this was still a few years before Japan made an incursion into that country. The border between Japan and Russia is a kind of a blur. When this book was in preparation, the two countries were still at war in those regions. None of these little things are mentioned in the text of the volume, of course. Now here, this is another good one, this little emblem here. Hasegawa was nothing if not an astute businessman, and given the high cost of producing woodblock illustrations, he did everything he could to recoup those costs by reusing the woodblocks in other publications. I don't have an example of this to show you right now, but many of the illustrations in this block were used later in his catalogue in the production of such things as catalogues or other items, of course without this accompanying text. It's not just the flowers. If you look carefully, this is so cool, at this little soccer emblem, you can see that it was printed from a block that must also have included some lettering, which is here visible as a kind of ghost writing because they didn't rub it with any pigment, but it did get touched by the baron. It's very hard to make out, but I believe the lettering above the cherry blossom is from the words Mary E. Unger, carved in cursive lettering. On the line below, I can make out something something T-E-D. I think it perhaps says printed. Then my guess is that these are remnants of the title page of the first edition, which I have never seen. Perhaps one of the viewers of this video can one day work this out for us. Back at the very end of the book, this is really fun, Hasegawa included a list of other items that he had available at that time. And this is extremely valuable to researchers studying his affairs, as it gives a complete snapshot of what he had published at that time. It includes prices. The book we are looking for is on the list here and retailed for $2.50. 
Sounds like a pretty good bargain to me, although I really have no idea what that kind of money would have been worth in 1906. So there you have it. It's an absolute treasure. Showing it again, just how stunningly beautiful woodblock prints and books can be when produced by supremely skilled craftsmen under the direction of a man who knew what was possible and who had the resources and vision to make it happen. Will we ever see the likes of such a book ever again? It doesn't really seem likely. This was only possible because Japan at the time was a third world country and labor, even such highly skilled labor, was cheap and abundant. The foreign customers who bought such items, they were rich in comparison and it was that imbalance that made this all possible and which is of course no longer present. But it was fun while it lasted and now we've got the legacy. Thank you very much for listening tonight. We'll be back soon with something else from our little collection, and I'll see you then.